Hi, uh, so my name is Evan Roux. I'm an independent free and open source uh, software developer, uh, mostly focused on GDAL, Map Server Approach, and QGIS. So in this talk, I'm going to go over the changes GDAL has uh, received uh, this past year for the 3.4 and 3.5 releases. And uh, I will also talk uh, a bit about future directions. So uh, what's GDAL in, in what slide first? Uh, it stands for the Geospatial Data Abstraction Library, which is a black box you use often without realizing it when you want to read and write uh, geospatial formats in most C or C++ uh, open source or closed uh, uh, source uh, GIS software. And as of today, it handles um, uh, roughly uh, 250 different formats and as a trend of recent years, also network protocols and services. Uh, GDAL is released uh, with a MIT open source license, which is uh, super permissive. And we release a new f version with uh, features every six months and uh, uh, have bug fix releases uh, every two months. Um, in GDAL 3.4, uh, we have uh, added a new driver to read and write uh, data sets in the ZAR format. So what is ZAR very quickly? Um, it's a cloud-oriented format for the storage of chunk compressed uh, multidimensional arrays. And here I've, I've tentatively uh, tried to present a 3D index grid. So you have the concept of chunking, uh, which is a process of grouping uh, together data values uh, along a number of samples in each dimension. And functionally, ZAR uh, shares a lot of concept with a NetCDF or AGF5 formats. And uh, it's actually quite common to see uh, ZAR data sets being converted from NetCDF. So similarly to NetCDF4 and ZAR, you will have a hierarchical organization of arrays in groups. Um, the values of arrays can be numeric data types, strings, compound data types, and some more esoteric data types. Uh, metadata can be attached uh, to arrays and it's uh, defined in JSON files. And one big difference with NetCDF or HDF5 is that ZAR is a multiple file format. So each chunk of data is stored as a separate uh, file. This can kind of advantages uh, for parallel update of data sets um, or if you need to extend the data set in any of its dimensions, for example, time. And uh, there are supports also many different uh, lossless compression methods with filters such as delta encoding, which can uh, increase the efficiency of compression. Uh, one important point to, to have in mind is that uh, ZAR doesn't come from the geo community, so you might encounter uh, difficulties as you might already have with NetCDF or HDF, uh, where there's no canonical way of encoding georeferencing. Um, and as I said, a number of uh, data sets are actually converted from NetCDF, so the NetCDF CF conventions are often found in ZAR data sets. Uh, also to be noted, the ZAR V2 specification, which is the one in uh, actual production currently, has been submitted uh, as a candidate uh, for OGC community standard. So what's exactly in the GDAL ZAR driver? Uh, so it has read and write capabilities. Um, it's natively writ written to use a new uh, GDAL multidimensional API, which was uh, an addition in uh, GDAL 3.1. Uh, but it also supports exposing ZAR data sets as classic 2D raster uh, for easier consumption. Um, the driver also handles uh, most common ZAR data types, so mostly the numeric ones uh, as well as strings. And it works with both uh, local data sets or remote data sets that are stored uh, on uh, the usual commercial uh, cloud storage uh, you use uh, nowadays. Uh, the driver supports the current ZAR v2 specification and it also supports the experimental v3 one. And uh, it has support for CRS encoding as a specific metadata in the JSON files. And uh, the CRS can be encoded as WKT or ProJSON. And in some scenarios, uh, you can uh, uh, use uh, multi-threading uh, capabilities for 
parallel decoding of chunks. Uh, here I've put a, a few uh, links to uh, the ZAR specification itself and uh, the documentation of, of its uh, reference Python um, implementation. Uh, the documentation of the GDAL driver itself and uh, a link to the evaluation engineering report uh, of the OGC testbed where the driver has been uh, developed. Um, another driver that has been added in uh, GDAL 3.4 is Stack IT. Stack IT stands for Spatial Temporal Asset Catalog Items. So you are probably already familiar with it. But Stack is a family of specification and APIs for cataloging and uh, discovering um, data set metadata and stack items are um, the last level uh, of catalog when browsing us to uh, stack hierarchy. Uh, for the driver uh, to be able to use stack items in a useful way from a GDAL perspective, it requires that each item, each image um, is published with a few extra information to give the CRS uh, the size in pixels, the resolution, and the extent. And with all of that, the dr driver can build a, a virtual mosaic, which can be used directly, of course, but it can also be serialized as a VRT file, which is a GDAL specific format for um, virtual files and, uh, catal and mosaics. And uh, when you store as a VRT, it will freeze uh, the list of items and uh, enable uh, direct later reuse. Here I've uh, presented um, an example of a query uh, against the uh, Stack API implementation of a Microsoft planetary computer. So the query uh, has a filter on the collection of interests, the bounding box, and the daytime range you are interested in. And uh, uh, if you can see here, it's actually reported as a VRT uh, data set, a virtual raster, and you have the, the list uh, of all tiles uh, that participate uh, to this request, and uh, you have the usual uh, metadata you, you can find uh, on a GDAL data set. Now a rather advanced <laughs> topic about coordinate reference systems. If you store uh, coordinates in so-called dynamic CRS, um, things like WGS84 or ITRF, uh, you need to be aware that in the CRS coordinates of ground points uh, are not fixed and uh, they, they move over time. So this is a phenomenon of the order of a few centimeters per year, but over several decades it can amount uh, to shifts of one or several meters. So if you want to do precise uh, coordinate conversion to other CRS, you need to qualify each coordinate with a coordinate epoch. And most of the time, uh, uh, we are lucky that the coordinates of the same data set are referenced against the same epoch. So in GDAL, uh, we have decided to add an optional attribute with a coordinate epoch, which is stored uh, in the OGR special reference class. And with that, we are able to propagate that information down to proj, so you can have accurate uh, transformation between dynamic CRS and static CRS uh, using uh, time-dependent coordinate transformations. Uh, the main GDAL and OGR utilities have been updated to be able to specify a source and target coordinate epoch. And we have also worked with a format specification to be able to store that coordinate epoch in a standardized way. Uh, in the few popular formats like GeoTIFF, GeoPackage, or FlatGeoBuff. And uh, of course, we have uh, added that capability in GDAL own formats, the VRT and the uh, OxXML uh, sidecar file. That said, uh, if you have the choice, uh, I'd suggest not using dynamic CRS when, when you can, but rather use static plate fixed CRS to avoid all the complication of coordinate epochs and time-dependent coordinate transformations. Uh, now let's go forward to GDL uh, 3.5, which has been uh, released in May this year. So one of the big uh, work items was adding a CMake build system. For those who are not familiar with uh, CMake, it's an open source and cross-platform uh, tool to uh, address uh, software compilation process. 
Um, up to now, GDAL had two uh, different build systems, one for Unix-like systems and another one uh, for Windows. So having two different build systems uh, where most of they do is supposed to be common uh, was a maintenance and usage burden. Capabilities were not always identical and option naming was not consistent between the, the two systems. Uh, parallel builds were possible but a bit limited too. So, and for developers, uh, GDAL developers, they, they were lacking important features such as uh, tracking of uh, header dependencies. Um, so the choice of CMake uh, was uh, really obvious uh, to, to solve those issues and uh, uh, particularly because it also has good support in uh, IDEs such as Visual, Visual Studios and users uh, have been uh, really crying uh, for, for CMake for GDAL for, for many years, maybe 10 years or, or more. So the plan and schedule that uh, was agreed with the community was to add in GDAL 3.5 CMake has an extra build system, uh, so uh, close to the existing ones. So existing ones have been deprecated but uh, kept in GDAL 3.4, uh, 3.5, sorry. And in GDAL 3.6, uh, we will remove uh, this, those past uh, autoconf and, and make build systems to have CMake to be the only one. And actually, that's what has been done in GDAL master branch two, two weeks ago. So we are fully on track with, uh, with the plan. Uh, huge credits uh, belong to Hiroshi Miura, uh, who has provided the initial uh, material for the new build system. And this was really an amazing uh, contribution with all the dependencies that GDAL must address. And uh, other contributors have also helped a lot to, to improve once it was merged into GDAL master. And I should also tell that uh, given the many months, months long effort uh, this has required to, to be polished and uh, usable for production usage, this wouldn't have been possible without the funding provided by the GDAL sponsorship program. Uh, feature wise, uh, one big addition of GDAL 3.5 is the new GeoParket and GeoRo drivers. Both are both formats are open source, open specification, a specification of tabular file formats uh, with data organized in a column oriented fashion. So what, what does that mean? That is information for a given attribute or given field is packed together in, in the file by groups of many rows. Uh, whereas most of the vector formats are row oriented, you, you can think of a CSV file for example. And the columnar organization of Parquet and Hero uh, make it uh, better fitted for data analysis, uh, databases, or, or system. Uh, Parquet and Hero have also grown outside of the geo community. So there, there was a need to, to add uh, geo capabilities on, on top of, of them, and this is really what geo Parquet is. It's uh, an extension of top of Parquet to define a layer, um, layer metadata like the CRS the geometry type, as well as uh, how geometries are actually encoded in, uh, in the file. So in the case of GeoParket, they are encoded as uh, WKB. Um, so what's about Euro and, and GeoRo? Uh, I'm not going to go in, into the details uh, about the difference between Euro and Parquet. They, they belong to the same ecosystem. Uh, but basically, Parquet is more for long-term preservation and uh, efficient compressed storage, uh, whereas Arrow is more about um, in-memory processing and being able to transfer data between uh, processes on the same node, and occasionally it can be serialized on, on disk too. Um, other notable features uh, of GDAL 3.5 is that the GeoTIF driver has been extended to uh, the new codec uh, using the JPEG Excel compression. Uh, the L in JPEG Excel uh, means long terms and it's the intention of JPEG Excel authors to, to have the, this format to be, uh, uh, to, to have the same extent in time as a good old JPEG format, uh, if that's ever possible. <laughs> 
Uh, JPEG XL is a competitor uh, with other more modern image formats such as AV, IF, HC, IF, and WebP. Uh, there are various online comparison uh, uh, between those formats for, for those interested. JPEG XL has both uh, lossless and uh, lossy profiles. Uh, to be noted that uh, lossy JPEG XL can be obtained by transcoding existing JPEG file without any additional loss. And uh, when doing that, you will save uh, approximately 20% of uh, space. Uh, the GDAL driver doesn't implement that feature. So. Um, JPEG XL can uh, support uh, thousands of uh, channels and bands. And perhaps the most interesting feature compared to JPEG is that it's really good for uh, high bit def uh, uh, data. So if you want to compress uh, uh, 12 or 16 bits uh, data sets, uh, this is definitely where it will shine. And uh, it also has a reference uh, optimized implementation, uh, libgxl, which is the one used by GDAL, of course. Um, you should also remember that, uh, or be aware that uh, this codec is only available if you build GDAL uh, with its internal libtif library because this codec is for now only in GDAL and has not been upstreamed yet in, in libtif. Uh, GDAL raster core uh, has been extended to support 64-bit uh, signed and unsigned integers for raster values and it's currently implementing the GeoTIFF key uh, NetCDF and HDF5 drivers. A new vector driver has been contributed for the proprietary SIP ANA database. Uh, you need also uh, their closed source uh, ODBC driver to have it fully working. And we have also removed uh, 10 or so legacy and unmaintained drivers to give, to give some room for the new things we have added in those pastures. A quick glance at uh, GDAR 3.6, which is planned for this November. Um, slightly related to what I mentioned previously about the GeoParket and GeoRoad drivers, we have added uh, a new API or new virtual method in the OGR layer class to be able to read uh, an OGR layer, vector layer, um, as a Euro in memory compatible uh, representation. And this allows uh, for higher throughput when uh, you want to, uh, to get data from an uh, OGR uh, data source. And it also eases uh, uh, inter interoperability with a number of uh, packages in the R and the Python ecosystem, such as GeoPandas, among others. Another main work is the uh, enhancement uh, of the Open File GDB driver, which is a fully open source driver uh, that uh, reads uh, S3 file geo database. So now it has uh, creation and update capabilities. You no longer need uh, the proprietary SDK to, to do that. So it will uh, make the interoperability with uh, S3 software much easier. There are also uh, a new driver for standalone JPEG Excel file, what I mentioned previously was JPEG Excel embedded in, uh, in TIFF files, and also new driver for a few GPU texture formats. As I mentioned uh, previously, uh, the GDAL project uh, has been running uh, a sponsorship program for one year now, and it has been very successful uh, to enable the project to tackle a lot of small or bigger tasks that tend to, to lack from contribution or regular funding. Um, and it has also benefited to uh, other dependencies of GDAL, such as Proj and uh, more recently Geos. So big thanks to our sponsors to make it possible. And that's it. <laughs>